I'd like you to know the reality of how every man a warrior really came about. In 1988, I mentioned this before, I had a crisis of faith. And I began to realize that the good theological Bible studies I was doing with men did not touch the 90%. And I also realized that most of the men did not really want to reproduce what I was doing with them. Now, I was teaching them really good theological stuff. I remember one time we did a uh, synthetic Bible study method on the book of Jonah. And I did this with a group of four men because this was the new next thing to do. I had heard that this thing called synthetic Bible study was new. It was on the market and no, you know, it was something that people were really enjoying. And so I thought, okay, that's what we'll do next. And we went through the book of Jonah together, and we had fun. We laughed. We loved it. It taught us how to outline the whole book. It taught us what were the key verses of the book. What were the key themes of the book? We, it taught us all this great information about the world's greatest evangelist. And at the end of the six weeks of teaching these men a synthetic Bible study, I said to these men, men, how many of you want to go out and get a group of other men and you want to teach them synthetic Bible study on the book of Jonah? <laughs> and nobody did. Now, I'm a Kansas farm boy. That makes me practical. And if my job as a navigator is to multiply to the third and fourth generation, it didn't seem like I was doing my job very well. And so this began to gnaw at me that what we were doing with men was something that nobody really wanted to multiply. And the reality was, is that the Lord began to give me insight too. Every once in a while in the Bible study, I would just say to the guys, hey, before we start the Bible study, tell me what's going on in your life. And the men would tell me about their hurting marriages, their children that weren't doing well, money was tight, work was awful. And in the 1990s and 2000, when we got more and more of the internet, guys would, you know, open up and say, you know, when I'm really frustrated, I go home and I look at porn. And I begin to realize once again, I'm not doing Bible studies that touch these areas. And so every man a warrior came out of a frustration that what we're currently doing in men's ministry or what I was currently doing in men's ministry wasn't really being effective. So I begin to pray, Lord, we need a new Bible study. Would you hurry up and get someone else to write it? And uh, I prayed that for 20 years. <laughs> Consistently. I mean, it, I do prayer walks. And I mean, it, I pray for my wife and my family and our ministry and our funding. And, and out of my mouth would come, Lord, would you hurry up and get someone to write a good Bible study on money, marriage, raising children, sex, moral purity, work, going through hard times. Because men really need this and there's not one on the market. And I know I prayed that at least 200 times. Well, in May of 2009, I'm out on my prayer walk. I would prayed for my family. I would prayed for the finances. I would prayed for the ministry. I would prayed for all this stuff. And out of my mouth came those exact same words. Lord, would you hurry up and get someone to write a good Bible study? And the Lord spoke to me and said, yeah, the time is right and I want you to do it. Now, I want to tell you that during those 20 years that I had been praying for this, God had actually been writing it in me. Now, most of you have heard this, or some of you had. About half of you, I don't know, but many of the rest of you have already heard this story. In 1991, I'm having my quiet time, and the Lord speaks to me and said, Lonnie, you're going to go through testing. And I had no idea what that meant. I was married. We had two beautiful children. They were three and five. And four months later, my wife had the first of hundreds of flashbacks of grandpa dragging her into the basement and doing awful, horrible, terrible things to her over a 10 year period. Now she had repressed all of this. She'd gone to college. She'd gotten her degree. She'd gone on navigator staff. She had been a missionary in Romania, undercover like I was, that's where we met. We got married, we had two kids and this thing exploded in our life. And she's never recovered. But we went from a pretty normal couple, and it was like within three weeks, we were in hell. Uh, there was so much anger and rage coming out as she remembered what had happened to her that 
I just, I didn't think our marriage would survive. Now, God used this over the next 20 years to write every man a warrior in me. And I, of course, would have never chosen this kind of thing for my life to go through this kind of severe suffering. But God had a plan. Now, how many of you have done book two and memorized the marriage commitment? It is my privilege. Say it with me, men. It is my privilege to show my love for Jesus by caring for my wife, to love her, show her honor, try to understand her, and to give up my life and rights for her. Man, I couldn't have written that for you if God hadn't written that to me first. So every man a warrior came out of real life stuff. My wife was incapacitated for many years, and so I became a single dad. She was in counseling two and three times a week, so we were spending eight, nine, ten thousand a year on counseling, and so all of a sudden money issues became very, very real. And each one of these things God used to write every man a warrior. Now, I went off and got my counseling training, and so more and more I began to counsel then. And uh, so sh as I began to be taught by the Lord principles on money, marriage, raising children, sex, more purity, work, going through hard times, I began to share these with men, and God brought me specific men, I'm convinced, because he knew he wanted their story in Every Man a Warrior. How many of you like the stories in Every Man a Warrior? Are that help, that's helpful for a man to find the context for a verse when he's got a real life story. Now, all of those stories are true. The names and places and have been changed, but all those stories are true. Now, why is Every Man a Warrior working? I think it's because it comes from real life experience, but maybe even more important, it comes from, I believe, a biblical template on what God has to say about men's ministry. And so the purpose of our time tonight is for us to build together a biblical template on what God would have us accomplish in men's ministry. Because if we don't feel that we have a biblical foundation for why we do what we do in men's ministry then I think we begin to go all different kinds of directions. We do all different kinds of things. This Bible seems equal to that Bible study. This plan seems equal to that plan. And so if you are going to be an expert builder of men, that's why you're here. To become an expert builder of men in men's ministry, we have to know why we do what we do. Okay? So let's turn to page three. And we're going to show the next video. Now, most of you have seen this, but it gives me a tremendous opening into how we do this training. So can we show the 92nd Every Man a Warrior video? For every 10 men in the church, nine will have children who leave the church. Eight will not enjoy their work. Six will only pay the monthly minimums on their credit cards. Five will have a major problem with pornography, and four will get divorced, affecting more than a million children each year. No man wants to fail, but few men feel equipped to face the challenges of life. When hard things happen, most men just don't know what to do. Every Man a Warrior equips men to succeed in life. Every Man a Warrior helped me to be a better father. It helps me to get control of my money. Every Man a Warrior helped to heal the wounds of my past. It saved my marriage and taught me to value my wife's opinion. It's the first time my husband has been the spiritual leader of our family. Every Man a Warrior taught me how to walk with God. Why didn't someone tell me these things 20 years ago, before I made so many mistakes? Every Man a Warrior has three books, Walking with God, Marriage and Raising Children, Money, Sex, Work, Hard Times and Making Your Life Count. This is a discipleship course designed for groups of four to six men, one-on-one -on -one, or even Sunday school. Every Man a Warrior takes commitment, but it's worth it to invest in yourself, to succeed in life. Every man a warrior. When I was do first doing men's ministry, 
I was using what I now classify as the smorgasbord theology of men's ministry. One year I would do synthetic Bible study, and the next year I would do the book of Romans, the next year I would do something else. Or if, there, you know, if Chuck Colson wrote a new book, then the fifth year I would read a book with men. How many of you have ever done that? Okay, you're normal. Um, and I began to realize this wasn't really effectively discipling men, and uh, none, about it, none of us was reproducible. We were always waiting for the next big thing to come out. Now, as I began to look at my ministry and also where I saw most Christian men, this is where I began to get really concerned. So on this sheet, you have these statistics. For every 10 men in the church, nine have kids who leave the church. Eight will not find their job satisfying. Six can only pay the monthly minimum on their credit cards. That means there's significant financial pressure. Five have a major problem with pornography. That figure is about 10 years old. Christianity Today just two months ago said that 67% of Christian men now dabble in porn on a regular basis. Okay? And four will get divorced, affecting more than a million children a year. Um, do I have permission to ask you a really hard question? Yes. Okay. Do you believe these statistics? Yes. How many believe that these statistics are accurate? Okay, good. So we're on the same page. This is where men are currently at, Christian men. An easier and better question, and probably more important, is if we want to get different results, are we going to have to do something different? Okay, that's the key. So we're on the same page. If we're going to have effective men's ministries, we can't do the smorgasbord version. We've got to do something different, and the key now is to find out what do we do. Now, I went back to the New Testament, and there's these key figures in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul. Now, if you're, I'm on page six now. You can follow along in your notebook. You've got these, so if you'd like to take notes, feel free to take some notes here. And, of course, the Lord Jesus gave us the Great Commission. Go make disciples. In fact, go make disciples, teaching them to do everything I taught you. In fact, the thing that he taught them was to go make disciples. So we should go make disciples who we teach to go make disciples. Now, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.10, he said, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. That verse kept me awake at night. An expert builder? What would it mean to be an expert builder, especially in the issue of men's ministry? And so during these years when I was wrestling with God... I was asking God to show me, to tell me, how would we do this? And even though I was praying that God would write, have someone else write Every Man a Warrior, a, a new Bible study, I was constantly thinking about it, and I was trying new things with men. Let's see if we can build a biblical template for men's ministry that comes from the Scripture. Now, all of you who have been through Every Man a Warrior know that the foundation for the whole course is Matthew 22, the great commandment. In fact, in my mind, how many of you know this verse? Matthew 22, 36, 30, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first, and this is the greatest commandment. What happens when we ignore the first and greatest commandment? I think our ministries go awry. We miss something that's so significant. And one of the most important things that we've learned in men's ministry is that in a man's love relationship with God is where real life transformation takes place. 67% of Americans have said they no longer believe the church is relevant because they look at Christians and they see that Christians don't have answers. They see that Christians' lives are no different than the non-Christians or the non-church going people. They get divorced just as often. Their kids are just as much doing stuff that they shouldn't be. And so how many of you have seen this, that in your quiet time, God deals with a specific issue in your life? How many of you have experienced that? 
You cannot have time alone with God on a consistent basis and not hear God's voice. And I believe that one of the reasons every man of warrior has been so successful is that it is built on the foundation of the great commandment to love God, to love God and walk with him all the days of our life. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, even though later in the conference we're going to talk about this. To walk with God deeply, you have to become a man of the word. You have to spend time in the scripture. We teach a man how to have a daily quiet time, don't we? We want men right up front to begin to spend time alone with Jesus. We also want these men to become men of prayer. So these first three building blocks are really foundational to any ministry, not just men's ministry. If you want to have a ministry that actually causes transformation in a man's life, it has to be based upon his intimacy with Christ. You follow me? How many of you believe that there is a direct correlation between a man's intimacy with Christ and his fruitfulness as a man? How many believe that? Good. That's in John 15, the vine and the branch. And in John 15, it says, if a man abides in me, he will bear fruit. If a man does not abide in me, he's cast forth as a branch, the branches wither, and we throw him in the fire and burn him. They're worthless as far as fruit bearing. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so proving to be my disciples. Intimacy with Christ is the foundation of a transformed life. And so when you and I are discipling men, we zero in on the quiet time, don't we? We know that if a man is skipping his quiet time, he's missing out on the most important aspect of the Christian life, and that is developing his walk with God. And we know that transformation won't take place. Now, as I continue to pray and wrestle with God over this whole issue of men's ministry, I hit the jackpot when I found 1 Timothy 3, in Titus chapter 1. Now, in your notebooks, keep your hand there on page 7 or 8 and go back three or four pages because we're going to read this together. Page 4. This is the passage where Paul says to Titus and Timothy, this is what elders and deacons, spiritual leaders, mature men of God are supposed to look for or supposed to look like. When you're choosing elders and deacons, here's what you're supposed to look for. Let's read this together because we're going to tear this passage apart. Titus 1, 6 through 9. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. 1 Timothy 3. Here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy fully of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold to the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then, if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his own household well. We want to make sure that what we're building as a men's ministry template comes from the scripture. And then go back 
to page eight, the qualifications for spiritual leaders. Now, as I tore this apart, you can see on the page, I tried to change the font and I underlined certain things. But the biggest thing is you look at this page, I've got it in purple font up here, are issues of character. Spiritual leaders, godly men, need to be men of godly character. Now, we're going to come back to this because if we're going to develop men's ministries where we help men develop character, we've got to ask the question, how do you build godly character into the life of a man? But I wanted to point out to you that most of this is about character. So let's kind of pull this aside, take all of this out, and see what's left. Look at how much is in this passage on marriage and raising children. It's about 25%. Now, I know in the past we use this as a way to disqualify people for spiritual leader. We are not doing that. We're looking at this passage as a way to build future leaders. We're trying to figure out what our target is. You know, if you don't know what you're going to shoot for, you're going to miss it every time or you're going to hit it every time. We're trying to figure out what we're shooting for in men's ministry. So... Does it make sense that if we're going to build a men's ministry, according to what we just read, that we should have a significant building block on marriage and raising children? Does that make sense to you? That Paul said, here's what a good elder, deacon, spiritual leader should look like. He's got to be a man who understands biblical principles on marriage and raising children, and he's actively put them into practice, and we can see it in his family. Okay, do you see how I'm doing this? Okay, now the next one is the issue of money. It doesn't look like much here, does it? But when you add to the fact that Jesus spoke on money more than any other subject in the Gospels, except faith in the kingdom of God, prayer, faith in the kingdom of God, money is a big issue. It's talked about over 2,000 times in all of the scripture. And Jesus talked about it a lot. So when you combine it with the fact that Jesus talked about it a lot, the Apostle Paul said it's one of the realities, it's one of the measurement standards by which we evaluate a man's life, his attitude, his heart relationship with money. In fact, this often talks about his heart relationship with money. He can't be greedy. So does it make sense that we would have a building block on money in our men's ministry template for what we're going to do in men's ministry. Now, we tie work to this because we go to work to earn money. All right? Does this make sense to you? All right. Now, this was the one that really surprised me. When I started looking at this, I began to realize that there's a tremendous amount in this passage on sex and moral purity. 2,000 years ago, before we had electronics, before we had pornography... I'm on page 9. This passage talks a lot about sex and moral purity. Page 10. Does it make sense that if we're going to build a men's ministry according to a biblical template, that we would have a building block on sex and moral purity? Okay. Now, let's go back to that issue of character. The very first slide said that about... 19 different character qualities were revealed in this passage. I think I've got them here. Character issues are underlined on page 4. How does God build character into the life of a man? Well, the scripture tells us that all of us are going to go through hard times in life and that the purpose of going through hard times is for us as Christian men to have God build our character. How many of you know James 1, 2 to 4? Oh, yes. Rejoice when you meet trials, because these trials have been brought into your life by God <laughs> to make you a better man. How many of you as men have never gone through hard times? Raise your hands. <laughs> How many of you have gone through hard times? It's part of life. We live in a fallen world. Now, the key issue that we bring out to help men is that when we as men go through hard times and we're walking with Jesus, the key reality is that when you and I go to God and do what's right, 
God can transform our life. The reality, though, is that we need a building block about men going through hard times. So in the Every Man a Warrior course, we've got a man who loses a business. We've got several stories about men whose marriages go south. We've got several stories about men whose children aren't doing well. These are the places where we struggle as men. Money, work, marriage, raising children. And these are the places where God uses hard times as a sandpaper to knock off some of the rough edges of our life. Okay? Do you believe that we should have a building block called going through hard times in our men's ministry strategy? Okay. Now the Apostle Paul and the Lord Jesus both talked about this capstone. This capstone is what we call the Great Commission. I'm on page 11 here. And as navigators go make disciples, this has been something that we have given our life to for the last 85 years. But I observed in the community in Omaha, Nebraska, where I was, and many ministries that I was involved in, that most ministries did not really multiply. I myself experienced that when I was teaching theological truth, not teaching on the 90%. It wasn't that teaching on theological truths was wrong or bad. It's just that most men don't live there. And they're crying out for help in the 90%. So anyway... Going and making disciples who go and make disciples is something that we in the scripture call the Great Commission. And in this illustration, I like it that the two pillars of our faith, the Great Commandment and the Great Commission, the bottom building block, the top building block, are the two greats of the Bible. But why is it that making disciples is so important? Why is it that we should really focus in on this? And I, can't, I think the key is, is that men come to spiritual maturity when they begin to teach spiritual truth to another man. I'm on page 12. How many of you learned as much going through the second time in Every Man of Warrior when you were responsible to lead as you did the first time? How many of the spiritual truths, how many of you know that the spiritual truths went deeper in you the second time through? Now, this is just an educational graph from the learning pyramid here. So from an educational standpoint, we realize that true learning really happens at some of the deepest level when we are forced to teach it to another man. Now, let me ask you a question. What kind of grade do you want to get? A, B, C, D, F. What kind of grade do you want to get in the areas of life, the topics of life called money, marriage, raising children, sex, moral purity, work, going through hard times, and making your life count? What kind of grade do you want to get? A plus? Yeah, most of us. Now, at what point in the learning pyramid do we get to that point where we're kind of in that B plus, A minus range? 90% comes when we begin to teach others. Now, I believe that the Lord Jesus understood this. He said, guys, I want you to go out and make disciples. I want you to teach other men what I taught you. He knew that by teaching other men, they would grow in their own convictions about what is true. And how many of you have felt this, that when you were forced to teach another man about marriage, about money, about sex, about raising children, when you were forced to teach another man, your convictions grew yourself. Yes. This has been the most significant revelation for me as to why it is so important that our ministries multiply. Because men really do come to maturity when they start teaching spiritual truth to another man. I hope you write that down. Men come to true, deeper levels of spiritual maturity when they begin to teach spiritual truth to another man. So in the Every Man of Warrior ministry, how would we measure success? Well, one of the most important things for us is when we evaluate churches or groups or so on is how many men in that group went on to disciple another man? How many men went on to lead a group of their own? 
Because we know just from an educational standpoint that that man will not really come to true spiritual maturity, have really strong convictions about what the Bible says on how to live in money, marriage, raising children, sex, moral purity, work, until he's forced to teach those truths to another man. You with me on this? How many believe what I'm saying? Okay, you've seen it work in your own life. Okay, so when the Lord gave us the Great Commission, He had more in line than just go teach stuff. I'm convinced He had in mind you and I coming to maturity as spiritual sons and daughters. We know this happens when we're forced to teach others. My good friend Don Kissinger gave me this, that there's different ways that we learn. And as you can see from the top, when we have a lecture format, which is what I'm doing right now, you guys will only remember 5% of what I say. Now, if you take your notebooks home and you study or you discuss it with another man, you might remember 50% of it. If you go home and teach some of this to other men, you'll remember even more of it. But we have got to get away from this passive-only learning because we are not getting the transformation we need. And we are not bringing men to maturity where they know how to teach their children and grandchildren and other men spiritual truth. I often ask this, men, how many of you have sons? Raise your hands. How many of you have sons? How many of you want your sons to fail? Who's going to teach your sons about money, marriage, raising children, sex, moral purity, work, and going through hard times? Who's responsible to teach them for that? We are. we are. That's exactly right. Now, you guys know that because you learned Ephesians 6, 4. It is the Father's God-given responsibility to train His children. But if you and I don't know spiritual truth, how can we teach spiritual truth to our sons? And we're going to send every one of our son and daughters out into the real world someday where they're going to have to deal with money, marriage, raising children, sex, moral purity, work, going through our times. And if you don't know these spiritual truths, I believe we set our children up for failure. I'm getting mean in my old age. Come on. I'm sorry. I really am. No, not really. Maybe it's because I had cancer three years ago and I don't want to fool around anymore. But I'm at a, uh, uh, a men's conference where I'm the secondary speaker. I'm the backup speaker. We have another speaker who's really the, the high name speaker. He's known nationally and probably around the world and so on. So I speak first, warm up the crowd. A lot of the men are still, you know, coming in during the time I'm speaking. And then they always, they came because they really wanted to hear him. So he gives a wonderful message and he did a beautiful job. And he's a great guy. So after the conference, we're both at the back and we're selling our books. And we're standing side by side at two tables. I'm selling my Every Man a Warrior book and he's selling his book. And so during a lull in the sale, I begin to just talk with him. He's the pastor of a mega church in one of the southern states. And I begin to talk with him. He's about 45 years old. And um, so I said, well, now are you married? Yes, I'm married. You have children? Yeah, we got three and we got a fourth on the way. And I don't know why I said this, but out of my mouth came this question. Pastor, do you know five verses on raising children? And he said, well, I, I, I know the one on be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> I said, well, you got, you're putting that one into practice. And so I began to open up book two of Every Man a Warrior, and I said, no. You as a pastor, you as a man, you as a husband, you as a father, do you want the men in your congregation to successfully train their children? Of course. Then you need to know at least five verses on marriage and money and how to put them, and raising children, and how to put them into practice. So he took a set of books, and we'll see what he does there. But I really... Um, my heart breaks in, in sometimes when I talk with pastors. Now, I did church consulting for five years. And so we would talk through these kinds of things. And when a pastor felt safe with me, he said this. A number of pastors did. He said, Lonnie, we never had a class in seminary on money, marriage, raising children, sex, more purity, work, or going through hard times. 
So you're asking me to teach this stuff and I've got to learn it from scratch. And so my heart really breaks for him. Because if I'm seeing what the scripture says on doing men's ministry, these are the areas we've got to help men in. And we all do this. We will all do with someone else whatever was done with us. How many believe that's true? Yes. And so they went through seminary and they were taught how to teach Romans and Galatians and so on. And praise the Lord for that. But it is my opinion that we really, if we're going to have successful men's ministry, we've got to help men in these other areas. Men won't reproduce something that is not relevant. That's why they didn't want to go reproduce my great synthetic Bible study. By the way, I did a good job in leading that. <laughs> it just wasn't relevant. And men won't reproduce something that they're not committed to. But most men are committed to their marriage, to their families, their children, money. And as the video said, when hard things happen, they just don't know what to do. If you want to have a successful men's ministry, it's got to be relevant. And it's got to be something that they're committed to. The key to a successful multiplying men's ministry is to help men win the battles they fight every day. How many believe that? Okay, we're on the same page. Now... Here we are. We're going to come. This is basically the final slide. I think you got one more there. I've got to ask you a very, very tough question. We're on page 13 now. Do we have a biblical template for men's ministry? This is really important for you to answer in your heart. As we have gone through the scripture, the great commandment, the Great Commission, and then 1 Timothy 3 in Titus chapter 1, we went through that passage. You've got it there on page 4. And out of that passage, we pulled these key topics. Marriage, raising children, money, sex, work, going through hard times. Do you believe that this gives us from the Great Commandment, the Great Commission, Titus chapter 1, 1 Timothy 3, a biblical template for what we should target in men's ministry. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. How many of you believe this is a biblical template for men's ministry? Now, some of you may still be thinking it through. But if we don't know that the Bible gives us a target to shoot for in men's ministry, we continue, in my opinion, to bounce around doing all kinds of things. And we never get men to a point where we do the thing over and over and over again so that men begin to multiply that spiritual truth into the lives of other men. Now, if you flip back to uh, page 12 where we have those two slides on the learning pyramid. What I have observed in men's ministry is that we continue to have speakers come in. I often do this. And what the first speaker, I come in and speak on one thing. The next month, another speaker comes in and he speaks in on something else. And the men will remember about 5% of what they hear and they will apply almost none of it. The every man of warrior ministry is significantly different we are going to intensely focus on these key areas because we believe we do have a biblical template for men's ministry. Now, make no mistake about it. How many of you believe this? Men are crying out for help in these areas. Men are desperately needing help in money, marriage, raising children, sex, moral purity, work. How to walk with God. And they want to make their life count for the significant. They want to multiply. Now think about this with me. We have a biblical template and men are crying out for it. We have a biblical template and men are desperately needing help in this. If I'm hearing the Lord right, I believe that he's asking the Every Man a Warrior ministry to help change a paradigm in the body of Christ. And I think this new paradigm is that the Bible, the scripture, 1 Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1, the Great Commission and the Great Commandment does give us a biblical template for men's ministry. And so this is why we choose to do what we choose to do. 
Now, I think every man of warrior is an expression of this biblical template. You follow me on that? I think every man of warrior, that's how I wrote it. That's what I was thinking about when I wrote it. But we might upgrade every man of warrior or something better might come along in the future. But right now, this is what we've got. But I think the key is this that you and I believe we do have a biblical template for men's ministry. Yes. 